Great. So I want to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for still being awake um, after lunch. It's been a great conference so far. Um, one thing is that everybody's so spread out that you're not going to be able to nudge each other once the person next to you starts snoring. But um, anyways, uh, in terms of uh, the title, hopefully um, this, this talk will be uh, PG uh, rated. I, I promise not to drop any F-bombs unless my laptop crashes, in which case then no bets, all bets are off. Um, I need to make the standard disclaimer that I am speaking uh, solely for myself and not representing my company, VeriSign, or the OWASP Foundation. And actually, I suspect that some of the things that I say may be controversial even amongst the uh, AppSec crowd. So this is the obligatory who am I slide. I've, uh, I spent 20 years in systems programming and then started more or less a second career and have been in AppSec for over 20 years. So what you're probably thinking is you got the title of this slide wrong and you really meant who is this old knucklehead, right? But um, yeah, I've been involved a lot with eSAPI, which is, uh, used to be a flagship project of OWASP. Um, basically, I'm not going to mention any, try to be buzzword free unless you consider SBOM a buzzword. And unless you've lived under a rock for the last couple of years, SBOM is software bill of materials. So why this particular talk? Well, there's kind of a couple of reasons for that, three exactly. One is that I've been, I've kind of predated even like uh, the oldest software composition tool that I know, which is basically OWASP dependency check. Um, I've been doing things, actually it's probably been more like 2008, but um, like manually uh, decompiling patches to see, you know, if they allowed exploitable paths so that our team at a previous company um, had to patch right away. But the other thing is that it was I, uh, recently in the summer heard a talk by Jeff Williams, um, is a contrast security CTO that gave a talk uh, that he put up on LinkedIn and it kind of verified my suspicion about the SCA findings are almost all false positives. Right, so he had some of these things here. It agreed with my previous experience in doing code reviews for previous employers uh, and writing up the ESAPI security bulletins where I go through and analyze like all the you know, vulnerabilities and dependencies and write up something that says whether they're impacted or not in case it didn't, couldn't fix it. Um, but the thing that was my final breaking point for this talk was my experience in patching this particular CVE which is a, an Apache Common Files upload patch. And the reason for that, that and that's I, where the title came from, uh, and, and during the patch of this, it's like, you know, I'll mention basically why, um, you know, why the reasons for this, but it was a particular thing. I just thought that it was too high of a, of a score, because it, it, it's a denial of service attack, and it had a 7.5. It didn't make any sense to me. and. Um, a lot of other reasons that you'll, you'll find out here. So, so um, one of the things, this, this slide is from uh, Jeff Williams, and you can blame him for everything except for the, the bad pun at the top. But um, it's, I think, kind of revealing, and this is what I said, basically kind of agrees with my, my intuition and my anecdotal experience, that almost everything basically is really false positives, right? When you have inactive code, there is no exploitable path to code that does, never gets called in your application, right? So that's kind of the gist of this whole pyramid thing is basically you have basically very, very little risk. And yet the SCA tools basically are, that's where it primarily points out things is in this open source stuff, most of which is inactive. So one of the things is, as humans, right, we tend to overreact to new risk or unknown risk. Um, and so we treat vulnerabilities in the same way that we do end products, and I think that's kind of a mistake. 
Um, we try to measure the severity of them both the same. For instance, we use CVSS scores for both. And then we also conflate uh, severity of the vulnerability with risk itself. And CVSS scores, according to first.org and according to NVD, basically measures the severity of the vulnerability, not risk. They're not the same thing. All right, so um, we end up basically, you know, as a result, kind of treating everything as the same size fits, every, everything one size fits all, equating like, for instance, highs or criticals in a product the same as we would a high in a, or, or a critical in a, in a library. And I think that's a mistake, right? Um, so as a result, we act as if the only option we have is to patch everything now or else we have to accept the risk and maybe try to patch when we get around to it. Um, but why not patch selectively? For instance, if we could say, we know these things are, in, this code is inactive, it's not reachable, we could, you know, basically in the meantime, sandbox the application, or we could use virtual patching with a WAF if you wanted to as an alternative, or you could run like IAST or RASP or something like that, and then try to gather that dynamic information to tell you what basically needs to be patched. Um, so one of the things is that I've come to the conclusion that basically we need to treat libraries and end products differently in terms of when we rate their severities. And when I say libraries, I'm talking about like any kind of an SDK, um, like a DLL or shared library or a JAR. Um, and even in some cases, you can treat web services, like that are only web services as a library. Um, end products are more like standalone executables, you know, web servers, appliances, stuff like that, right? There's, there's a difference between them in their static and, and dynamic behavior. There's a difference between them in the extensibility, for instance, like libraries can be extended not only from like say uh, deriving new classes to extend the library, but also just in the way that you use them. You can mix them up and you can call selectively, you know, any particular class or method. Whereas like generally you don't have that level of control, those degrees of freedom with a product. Um, beyond at least what you can configure with configuration files. Um, so, the, you know, I think one of the things is, I don't think anybody here probably that has a lot of experience with vulnerability management, particularly likes CVSS. I think we all think that it sucks. But in my opinion, I think that the fact that it's treated as a risk score, right, and, and not, as a, uh, not as a severity, that's one big problem. But I think that it sucks worse for libraries and that's because you're told, and I'll show you on the next slide, you're told that basically that you need to portray that as the worst case scenario. But that actual worst case scenario ever happening is actually very, very rare, right? So my conjecture is as I, as I see all these library scores, they almost always are typically a little higher than the, uh, li uh, what they would be if they were in a product, right? And I have a, an example of that as well. So this is from the instructions uh, of the CVSS user guide from first.org, right? And I'll give you a second to read this, but basically pay attention to the highlighted section where it says, I don't know if everybody in the back is, can see that, so I'm gonna read this part for you. It says, scoring the library itself requires assumptions to be made. The analyst should score for the reasonable worst case implementation scenario, right? So that kind of tends to skew CVSS values for libraries higher than it does for end products because you're not told to do that for an end product. So here's an example of comparing two things. One is the denial of service attack and Apache Commons files upload that I had mentioned on a previous slide the one that caused all the F-bombs. And this other one is in the Fortra Go Anywhere product. Um, there, you can see that the CVSS vector is identical except for the places that I've highlighted, right? But the ones that really impact the score is this privileges required, this PR, right? N means none, low, L is low, um, H is high. It turns out that 
if that high in the Fortra product were changed to a low, that score would change from a 7.2 to an 8.8. .8. If it changed to none, like it is corresponding in the library, it would end up as a 9.8, which would be a critical. But because you don't score those as worst case, it just got scored that way. And ironically, in that Fortra product, there are actually zero days in the wild that were observed. So it's like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, geez, we don't know how to exploit this. So SBOMs to the rescue, right? Um, SBOMs uh, were part of the mandate from the federal government, executive order that Biden signed. Um, it required us to basically provide the software bill of materials in an electronically accessible format. Uh, and like the SBOM itself included things like a unique component name, uh, a package URL where it got downloaded from, um, the version information, uh, me various message digests, including for some strange reason, two broken ones, MD5 and SHA-1, which they decided to put in there even though they have collisions, which so kind of makes it pointless. But, um, uh, but essentially, you can think of an SBOM of your product or an SBOM of a library of basically all the ingredients that are, or dependencies that are used to construct that product, right? And the motivation is to assist us in identifying which software artifacts are affected by either a specific CVE or a future one, right? It could also obviously help you pass uh, compliance checks for the government where it's definitely mandated. So like if you're doing FedRAMP things, you would have to have it. Um, I ran across this article, uh, I think it was in September, uh, and it was actually about AI security risks, but they had this particular section about SBOMs. And it, this, so that's what this is about. And it says, and I'll read it in case you can't see it in the back. The idea behind such a thorough inventory is that companies can better track the nuts and bolts of their software, including whether it houses security vulnerabilities like the log4j flaw, and more quickly to respond to them. Now, we kind of got to admit, right, this is all of everybody's pipe dream for uh, SBOMs. Uh, and pretty much what we uh, sold our management on, the promise that we sold our management on to get our shiny new SCA tools, right? But in reality, I don't think we anticipated all the problems with having the SCA tools in terms of the false positives and stuff that they pop up. So that brings me to where do the SCA and SBOMs kind of fall short? SBOMs are really not the problem specifically. I think it's more of an SCA uh, thing. SBOMs are really just kind of used in one way to convey the information that the SCA tools provide. But the SCA tools basically expose a lot of false positives. They basically scream about everything. In fact, a lot of them not only scream about security vulnerabilities, but they scream about quality issues, right? And sometimes you can't even turn those off. Um, and so it's like it, you can't tune it down. So end up, ends up we end up wasting resources um, trying to patch things that are not really exploitable. Um, and because of the elevated uh, CVSS scores, because of using the worst case scenarios in libraries, it, they almost all end up at least as a high. Um, and so as a result, the things that we basically investigate or have time to investigate, we basically say, well, okay, this will never happen. Nobody ever uses this really obscure method in, in spring, for instance. So we're going to give them a waiver for this particular CVE, right? But that can come back and bite us in the butt because there may be a future application. If you're like waiving, you're creating a waiver for your entire organization, for your entire IT organization, right? And then some new project comes up and uses that obscure method, now you're toast, right? So there's that problem. The other thing is there are actually false negatives, and I'm going to give an example of that later. I do not know how common this is. I would say that it's happened at least twice for sure. 
Um, but most likely, much more than that, nobody's really just paid attention to it. Uh, and then it's an incomplete solution because one of the things is that you want to know if you have to patch stuff is not just what do I have to fix, which SBOMs will guide you to, but where do I have to patch, right? Where is the, what path is something installed in? What servers is it on? Stuff like that. So the SBOMs don't convey that information, at least currently. Uh, maybe the new Cyclone DX stuff maybe picks up that, I don't know. Um, but the way that you analyze CVEs in open source, right, is kind of just a general process. If you don't have a tool, this is kind of like what I used to do manually. Um, you, you try to figure out, you know, with a clue maybe in the CVE, sometimes they'll have a notes section or in a references section, they'll tell what the commit IDs were or what a pull request was. Or you can, if you can't do that, you can usually do a git diff across the previous and, and patched release branches or tags um, and, and sort of hone in on where to start looking, right? You also can look to see if there's a proof of concept exploit that was available. And if so, you can use it to test your code and see if it's vulnerable that way. And that's a really great way, but a lot of times proof of concepts are no longer available. Or if they are, they're only available on the dark web. Um, so you can also like do an access graph, right? Uh, create a call tree of affected components that through, through your dependencies, which kind of like involves doing a lot of recursive reps and eventually going up the dependency tree at each level. And then when you get to the top, you basically stop and you have this list of potential vulnerable components in, in your dependencies. And then you go back down and you look through all those possible call uh, all those that you look through all the paths in that call graph to look for exploitable paths. So places where like, you know, the data is completely untainted and unfiltered. So that's essentially the way we do it as humans. That's not the way the SCA tools do it. The way most SCA tools do is they look just at your list of dependencies and the version and say, oh, this version hasn't been patched, so you're vulnerable, right? This is an example of a dependency tree just listed from Maven with, with uh, um, and I'm sorry it's, it's so small, but basically you've already probably, everybody who's run uh, Maven dependency trees seen something like this. This one actually shows uh, the patch version of Apache Commons files upload. And you see here it's a direct dependency of eSAPI. But if it's like a, if it was somewhere down lower, oops. If it was somewhere, I don't know if you can see that laser, but like if it was down here, say, in one of these lower level transitive dependencies, then you'd have to start your analysis and go all the way up the tree until you get to your code. So this was kind of like my mood swings when I was going through the analysis of this and decided that I needed to write up a security bulletin for it, which I just published uh, last week. Um, First thing was like, oh bother, you know, Sneak tells me I gotta upgrade to the file upload jar, so yeah, I guess I better make some time for that. And the first thing as I went to the to the CVE description, and it said, oh, it affects file upload base. So I quickly grepped my code base because I knew it was a direct dependency, right? And I said, hey, I don't, I'm not using file upload base. Woohoo! It's like, so then I thought it was I was done, but then. Uh, then I actually started, because I, cause I usually have a habit of writing security bulletins up whether it's affected or not. And as I started looking closer, I saw a file upload base is actually an abstract base class, right? And I'm like thinking, come on, Apache, can't you like enumerate all the affected classes instead of making me do all the work, right? Um, but then I thought, wait, it's not just enough to upgrade, I have to actually make code changes too? And then I went back and I actually analyzed the details of their fix. And I'm like, wait a second, there's this denial of service attack, right? They didn't really fix the denial of service attack at all. So all they did, the, the particular CVE was about, you could put in an unlimited number of files per HTTP request. So they fixed that specific problem when they could have like said, 
let's limit the number of files per HTTP session, for instance, right? Which would have at least been a little bit better, right? Um, but they didn't do that. So they didn't really, and that's kind of like when I started dropping the F-bombs. So how do you basically combat the noise of keeping your F-bombs from becoming F-bombs? Well, there's kind of two different perspectives here. There's your developer's perspective and then like the blue team's perspective or your vulnerability management team or whatever you call them. Um, for the individual project perspective, for your development teams, right, they basically are looking at only one or two projects, but they may have, live, they have like, you know, two week sprint cycles and stuff like that and you're asking them to basically, hey, this is a high, you gotta patch it in, you know, seven days or 14 days or whatever your standard patch cycle is for that severity. And it's like a lot of times that's a disruption because it's difficult to squeeze into that sprint. In particular, it's like if it's a if it's a direct dependency, they can check real quick to say if they're using the, you know, the affected method or the affected class or whatever. But if it's a transitive dependency, it's really difficult. They have to do all that work that I described, you know, manually. Um, and so uh, there's, the, you know, and because there's so many of them, I mean, it's like typically like, you know, 20,000 uh, vulnerabilities, new vulnerabilities reported per year, right? And, you know, a typical application will have, you know, somewhere between two, 300, um, you know, vulner uh, dependencies in them, if you include the transitive dependencies or more. Um, so the other thing is there's the kind of the noise in the large that I call it, right? It's the enterprise level squawking that these tools produce. And what happens is they run this and because like everybody's not at the same level, every project is not using say the same exact version of Spring, right? The, the vulnerability management team has this tendency, they wanna like treat this as like operating system patches. And you can't do that. Operating system patching is way more mature, it's more centralized, and in particular, we have a lot more consistency between the operating system versions on all the different servers, because we build that with that intent to like all use the same version of RHEL 8 or whatever, right? But the projects, they don't all have like the same version of Spring, it's just they don't fix it unless they need to or they need to upgrade to get a feature. Um, so you have this, you know, the blue team sees basically this backlog of possibly thousands of unpatched libraries. So we have to do something a little better than just, you know, saying, oh, you gotta treat this as operating system patching. There's also a gap in the SCA tools because, I mean, and it's a credibility gap, I think, right? And it, it's starting to grow because more people are realizing this where they abandon one SCA vendor and, and then they pick up another one and find out it does the same stuff. And that's partly because, like I said, they all work more or less the same by looking at the list of dependencies only and they don't generally try to see is this actually some reachable code because if the code is not reachable, it's not exploitable. Um, so therefore we get, you know, so they're, they're selling FUD in, in a way, especially because of the fact that they also, hey, the, the security stuff is not bad enough, we're also gonna scream at you for not fixing the quality issues, all right? Um, but we get overwhelmed with false positives and most of this stuff is from transitive dependencies which we have very little control over. Developers, if you haven't noticed, right, are very reluctant to upgrade a version of a transitive dependency. For one, you have to basically exclude the version you're using, and then you have to trust that whatever it is that you're excluding it from, basically, that it'll work. And since you're not responsible for that regression test, you can't really run a complete regression test. So you hope that your regression test is good enough to, to surface any problem. Um, so, you know, if we force people to upgrade uh, transitive dependencies, you're gonna get into a big problem. It could potentially break stuff. Um, the other thing is that, to my disdain, uh, most of the vulnerabilities, or most of the SCA vendors actually have their own privately researched vulnerability databases that they report problems from as well. The problem with that is the fact that 
it's really impossible to vet this. Most of the time, they don't give you the details about what the problem is, where it is in the code, so you can't like go and verify that it really should be, you know, this level of severity. You just have to take their word for it. And then there's a false negative gap that you get from partial remediation. And this can happen when you get a patch that's not secured by default. And I'm gonna go into more detail about that. Here's an example. This is the text from the, uh, the CVE, the Apache Common Files Upload one, right? And if you look real careful, you'll see that highlight section that says, note, like all the file upload limits, so apparently they've done this before, the new configuration option, file upload base uh, and the method set file count max is not enabled by default. So in other words, we don't have an upper bound that we set, right? So you're right back to where you started and it must be explicitly configured. So what does this mean? Well, if you patch or if you're using something like renovate or depend the bot or sneak or something like that to automatically do a PR for you and it just like bumps you up to 1.5 or 1.6 or whatever, um, then basically you think that it's patched, your SCA tool stops complaining about it, but in reality you haven't fixed anything. So what are the takeaways and the suggestions? Well, first of all, what can we do as developers? If you're a developer of a library, is anybody in here a developer of a library? One person I see. Um, all right, so first of all, we have to be diligent, right? We have to do this for the benefit of the broader community. We can't be lazy like the Apache Common Files Upload team does and like, well, I'm not even gonna spell out all the details of what it is that's affected. I'm just gonna give you the top level abstract base class and you gotta research it yourself to see if you're affected, right? The other thing is they could have easily, it is not rocket science to basically make this patch. They could have left that method in there, but they could have put in a default upper bound. They could have done it through a system property. They could have just hard coded it to, I don't know, you know, 2K or something reasonable. But no, they just basically said, oh, we're just going to leave it unbounded so you have the same stupid problem that you had originally. And this is why they started dropping F-bombs, because it was like, I really didn't want to have to go back in and figure out where I had to fix this in the code, because it's like code that I never wrote. Um, so the remediation, right, first of all, so I mean, basically, we need to take pride as, as library developers doing things right. When we create a CVE, um, we need to be precise about the CVE description and, if, and the remediation should always be secure by default because if we don't do that, right, we are getting false positives, right, because that is all, all the SEA tools currently look at, at least right now, maybe they'll change after this talk, but it's basically, um, you know, they're all gonna, they only just look at versions, right? The other, the other thing, right, is like sometimes, like some of the Apache Commons uh, libraries at least, are made available in, with part of the OS uh, in, and patched with the OS. So basically, if you get the patch there and you're relying on the patches that come with the operating system, guess what? Because it's not secure by default, you're not secure even though you update the OS. Um, if you are not, if you're a developer and you don't have experience in security, then partner with a security AppSec engineer or security researcher and try to get them to, you know, help you give techniques to basically build this by uh, secure by default or, I mean, even though it makes, you know, it'll take you extra time, right? Now, even if we do all this, right, because like I tried doing this in eSAPI because I feel that the community, you know, deserves to be treated right. I don't think we always do a perfect job of it and we don't always get it out as quick as we would like, but like, so this is a view of Apache. When I did, the, when I released the 2.5.1 release back in November of 2022, and this was a view of the downloads over uh, a year's period, right, month by month, and 
the second page is actually just the screenshot from the bottom, and it drills down on the versions. And this was what was just dropped my jaw, literally. It's like, so 2.5.0 was the previous release that was released four months earlier. And so, you know, um, it was basically only had what? Uh, 12, no, 9%, right? So people were not keeping stuff up to date. But the thing is, if you look at the first three, one, uh, the first three things, those are like three of the oldest versions of eSappy. And one of the things that I said is, what the heck is like causing all these 2.1? I mean, it was like 2.0.1 was back from like, I think it was uh, June, no, no, July 2011, I think it was. And so I finally did some research I mean, it, it was very laborious, but I found one application that's in the top 2,200 um, of uh, the applications on Maven Central. Actually, it was not an application, it's an application library. So eSAPI was a direct dependency of it. And that application is, and I'm going to reveal their name because I'm just gonna publicly shame them, this was uh, in 2015, OpenSAML project did the last release and they put in eSAPI 2.0.1, even though in 2015, that wasn't even the newest release. So they started out with an old release, right? So it's like, this is what I'm talking about, you know, being diligent to the community, especially if you call yourself a security library, then try to act in a way that helps the security of everybody and not just take shortcuts. Um, yeah, from, from an AppSec perspective, um, take responsibility um, for yourself. Like for myself, right, I try to eat our own dog food. We try to eat our own dog food and, and follow these guidelines to help the community first. We don't try to hype, you know, things or fixes or vulnerabilities or anything. We try to do a detailed analysis of everything. I don't know how many people read it because I have evidence of all the stuff that we do, they don't even read the release notes. They just like, because like a lot of times we'll put in a new property that's critical, like, oh, we changed where the logger is. And they don't read the release notes and so they get exceptions and now like we get to go and answer 112 questions on Stack Overflow, right? So, but yeah, I mean, just sort of try to do the right thing. Uh, suggest workarounds when it's safe to exclude a dependency because you may not, I mean, they basically may not have a uh, regression test, but if you're comfortable that your stuff works, right, like we have about 80% code coverage in our test suite. So, and, and between that and actually looking at the code of where we use those particular libraries in the transit of dependency, that's one of the reasons I do the security bulletins, because it's like, I say, yeah, it's safe. If you wanna do this, if you can't upgrade like eSAPI for some reason, because maybe it's a transitive dependency, but there's this other transitive dependency of ours, you can update that and it will not break eSAPI, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean you can always do it because you may have it as a transitive dependency somewhere else, but. All right, so this is kind of an aside um, that I've been thinking of like, what can we use instead of CVSS? And I think this is kind of a open research uh, thing, but there's a couple possibilities here. Um, NVD, CVS actually includes a base score, a temporal score, and an environmental score, right? Temporal score basically says how does it change with time. So for instance, if there was not originally an exploit and now an exploit comes out and is in the wild, then that temporal score will go up. Um, an environmental component has to do with like, you know, how many instances of this you have and stuff like that. And a lot of that stuff, NVD doesn't know, so they don't try to score it. But it's one of the things that might be with the assistance of tool vendors, SEA tool vendors to like say for spring, for instance, we know we have this many instances and we can set like a, a score for the environmental component of, of a particular version of spring, for instance. Right, because we know how many, because of the S-bombs, how many people are using a particular version of Spring. So we could then maybe compute an environmental score. Um, the other thing is uh, 
CISA, the Cyber Security Infrastructure Security Agency, I think it stands for, um, has a thing called Known Exploited Vulnerabilities, or KEV. Um, KEV basically is only actively exploited vulnerabilities, right? So if they see in the wild that, that things are being actively exploited and it reaches a certain threshold, I mean, I'm not just talking about, oh, we see one isolated one, but it's a pattern of it, then they basically will put it on, on that KEV list. And as of August, I think there was like 981 uh, CVEs there. And sometimes they'll see something there that like is a zero day and they'll put it on and then they'll create a, a CVE from it. There's another thing, which I have not researched to be honest with you, but I just stuck it on here in case somebody wanted a reference to it. And it's something that I need to look into a little bit more. It seems a little bit more uh, difficult to score than CVSS, but a thing called uh, Exploit Prediction Scoring System or EPSS. All right, so um, suggestions and takeaways. What can we do as DevOps and stuff like that? Well, for one, if you're not already doing this, and I suspect a lot of people already are, right? Incorporate SCA scans into your CIDC pipelines. And in particular, not just do it for like production, but you really, it's important to do it uh, in QA environment and your, and your CI CD pipeline there so you get an early heads up warning, right? And then you maybe have a little bit more time to patch before you go into production and you can have time to prioritize those things a little bit better, right? The other thing is you can check to see, hey, is this CVE listed on the Kev catalog? Um, you know, and maybe also consider like weighting CVSS scores from NVD based on whether they're direct dependencies or first level transitive dependencies or second level transitive dependencies and wait, the, the further down they are, the less likely that they're actually going to be in your active code base in your application. So you could like weight them less and less and consider something, or you can consider like using the, uh, actually I think I got that wrong, the exploit prediction EPSS. You could consider using the EPSS. Um, now, the last thing here is a pet peeve gripe of mine, right? Because like one of the things I've seen is the, well, they're not patching everything, so we're gonna teach them a lesson and we're just gonna block them from going into production, right? So you, let's say there's a hypothetical case of where there's seven high vulnerabilities that you need to fix. One of them might be a transitive dependency and it's like, we say, well, you haven't fixed all of them. You haven't fixed that one in a transitive dependency. There might be 10 of them you fix nine of them, we're not gonna let you go into production, right? So now what we're saying is, it's okay to go into production with the potential that you're exposed to all 10 of those, right? or you're in production already and you're exposed to them, right? But we're not gonna let you fix nine of them and fix the other one in your next sprint. That, that makes no sense to me. That's letting the perfect become the enemy of the good. And that's no way to motivate a developer, right? So, I mean, the alternative is basically no patches at all. Um, what about takeaways for the tool vendor? Well, one, I think that they should stop using their uh, vulnerability databases unless they're going to be more transparent about it. I mean, they could either like publicly and externally vet these with some, you know, trusted third party uh, and allow them to write it up and provide some uh, testing evidence or whatever, but it's like right now it seems to me that the goal is kind of like, yeah, we want to compare our tools against some other competitor and whoever is the noisiest wins, right? Because we found more stuff than they did, right? It doesn't matter that, you know, 90% of them are false positives. FUD does not help secure the world, right? The other thing is that, and I've seen this in actual life, I am not going to mention because you know, OWASP, they might be one of the OWASP sponsors, so I don't want to ruin that relationship with OWASP, so I'm not going to say who did this. But I've actually seen this where um, one of the SCA vendors basically reported something that 
it said withdrawn from the CNA. CNA is basically the CVE naming authority. It used to be only MITRE, but now it's like things like Microsoft and Google and GitHub and stuff. Basically, they're anybody that can create a CVE ID um, and send it to NVD. And so they needed to stop reporting these because the NVD and the issuing uh, CNA has much more context than the SCA vendors. And if you insist on still porting, reporting it, do it as an informational thing or as an appropriate notice, right? The vendor that I'm talking about, they actually decided, yeah, we'll take it out and we won't report it as a CVE, but then they put it in their private vulnerability database and reported it there with the same you know, severity, so. Um, what about NIST and CNAs? What can they do? Well, we can distinguish between end products and reusable components. Libraries, I think, need, like I said, an alternative to CVSS scoring, or we need to consider multiple values or whatever. The other thing is I think that NIST needs to provide justification when they override the CNA recommendations. When I've worked with CNAs to report vulnerabilities, they've always come to an agreement and said, yeah, we think that it should be this. They understand the problem much more than NVD, who all they see is basically not the research and all the intermediate, you know, back and forth of showing the CNA code and everything else. They just see the final CVE description that the CNA submits to them. But then, yet they'll, they'll, they'll adjust the thing, and the CVSS score almost always goes up. Um, we could consider using Kev. Um, you know, if that's the case, then it could, the score could actually go down over time if it's no longer actively exploited. Uh, and then um, we, we need to, cons I think NVD and NIST rather needs to um, insist on pre precise uh, descriptions of the attack surface and the details. It should be ideally machine parsable so that when you call the APIs, you can get that information back. And they have to mention all affected methods and classes, especially if they're not making it secure by default. And then I think that I would like to see a special flag that says, you know, is this secure by default, true or false, right? Um, because at least then we know that we're going to be getting a false negative if we report it the normal way, right? And then these are some of the references I have. Um, this slide deck has been uploaded to the event uh, thing, and also I mentioned it, uh, it'll be on my private GitHub under presentations. Um, so if you have any questions, you can either ask me now or drop me an email or whatever. So. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. So I try to look for a patch and I end up going it says you have to do an off fix. Yes. And Spring Six basically uses uh Jakarta servlet instead. Yes, and it's a huge thing. I mean and that's an example of one like for instance that we've made a waiver and one of the things that I've talked about is basically saying, you know, those waivers those broad waivers especially can bite you in the butt. So you sort of have to like address it by now having your AppSec team look specifically for that call, right? I mean, that's about the only way that I know to get around this. So do I, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe I should turn the trace on at the log level and see where it is used in the stack? Yeah, you could do that or, yeah. I mean, the, the best solution would be basically to use a RASP-based um, thing. like. You know, I don't want to put in a particular plug for our vendor, but um, I might have mentioned them on the pyramid slide. Uh, on a slide with a pyramid on it. Uh, might be that company like has uh, tools to do that. Contrast. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have a question? I, 
I'm saying, well, the two things, right? One, I says, don't treat vulnerabilities in libraries the same as we do OS level patches, right? That's the first thing. I said, the other thing is I think that we should not treat the CVSS scores in end products the same as we treat them in libraries, right? End products, they don't have very many degrees of freedom, right? You don't generally get to select what features that get included unless like they have plugins or something like that that you can load, right? But with a library, you may selectively use certain classes or certain methods. And so you have, as a developer, a much more broader degrees of freedom of whether you're going to use that. And, and equating the two, I think, is just wrong. Anyone else have a question? You can't see too good. OK, well, I take it that nobody has a question and nobody's thrown anything at, him, at me, so I'm going to get off the stage before that happens. All right, well, thank you for your time. <laughs>